So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Today we have a visiting speaker uh, from the uh, Department of Medical Genetics. Before we begin, I would just like to remind everyone to please leave your questions, enter, please enter them in the chat at the end of the Medical Grand Rounds, and please answer a brief survey at the end of the presentation to know that you were uh, present with us today. I'd like to uh, uh, in invite the uh, medical director of the Division of uh, Medical Genetics, Dr. Uh, Bettina Lee, uh, to present our special speaker today. Bettina. Yeah, thank you. This is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. William Fox and Dr. Jean-Baptiste Rivière uh, again to this group. Uh, they've presented before, so you might remember them from last year. Um, so Dr. Fox is a member of the Division of Medical Genetics and uh, professor at the Department of Medicine, the Faculty of Medicine, and has a, a co-assignment with human genetics. And uh, Dr. Fox is one of the uh, big experts in cancer genetics, so we're very happy to have him and that he uh, again volunteered to speak here today. Uh, as I said, his research is focused on inherited uh, cancer predisposition syndromes, and he's discovered quite a lot of genes, and right now his group is mostly working on DISA-1, which is a microRNA that was a very uh, interesting discovery uh, multiple years back, and he's uh, working on uh, understanding better the genetic predisposition to cancer because that will improve in prevention and treatment options for the patients and also many family members who might also be at risk. And then from the uh, from OptiLab, the Department of Molecular Genetics, uh, Dr. Jean-Baptiste Rivière is going to uh, also present in this talk. Uh, Dr. Rivière is um, a molecular geneticist at the MUHC and also an associate investigator at the uh, MUHC Research Institute and uh, very involved in the bioinformatics platform. His specialty is in um, uh, analyzing uh, the next generation sequencing data that we get more and more. So it's uh, really a great pleasure to have both of these experts present to us and I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting presentation yet again this year. Thank you so much for to both of you to represent the division of medical genetics. Thank you, Bettina. Okay, so what are the major genes responsible for inherited sensibility to the common cancers? This is an overview um, in, in so two parts. The first part presented by myself and the second part presented by Jean-Baptiste. And he'll be focusing more on the uh, implementation aspects uh, as we move forward to um, with the repatriation of genetic tests to Quebec and the opportunities this offers us to um, to really um, go to the next step in terms of cancer sensitivity. So in, I put sort of here as a subtitle, what should be test, who should be test, who should do the test, and who should follow up on the results. So the outline is that I'm going to give you a brief history of the discovery of genes implicated in the common cancers. And then I'm going to talk about what genes should we consider testing for and who should be ordering these tests. And then, uh, as I say, we're going to talk about the developments and challenges overcome uh, at the genetic testing lab at the MHC, um, uh, which G JB will, uh, will, will uh, discuss, and then we'll have a, a summary at the end. So the objectives are to, to understand about how this knowledge was acquired over the years uh, about these genes, to compare and contrast the types of genes implicated in the major cancers, and to appraise the pros and cons of mainstream genetic testing, and finally, to, as I say, to be aware of these new developments at the MUHC uh, Central Molecular Diagnostic Lab, which is run by uh, Jean, Jean Baptiste. So, first of all, as you probably know, cancer is the major cause of death in Canada. It's overtaken heart disease because you have great treatments for heart disease. If, historically, it was the other way around, but as, uh, with, with drugs like the statins and, and, and control of blood pressure, um, heart disease has become a more of a controlled disease, a chronic disease, whereas cancer still uh, is a major cause of death in Canada. And uh, what to expect if you take uh, the entire population, you can see uh, on the left is incidence, on the right is mortality. You can see that prostate and colorectal cancer are the major causes of incident cancers in males. Uh, with pancreas uh, down at two two and a half percent in women, it's breast cancer, but also colorectal cancer as the major causes. So um, over in pancreas, uh, are coming in uh, again around the same incidence, around just under three percent. That's incidence. But when you look at mortality, what's interesting is basically it's the same genes: colorectal prostate and pancreas in in, in women, uh, in men, colorectal 
um, pancreas, ovary, and breast in women. So uh, these are the important cancers. And um, it's actually relevant because um, uh, it's a sort of a funny story that Robert Schwartz, who uh, was the editor of the New, who's the deputy editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, actually could have called me up and said, oh, well, would you like to write something for the New England? You know, yes, OK, that would be good. Uh, and, and then he said, well, you, what do you want to write it on? I said, well, let's write about the common cancer. She said, OK, fine. Why don't you write something on the common cancer? So that was the, really what I got interested in this topic, was writing this piece for the New England, which was, um, you know, a lot of work, but actually a lot of fun. And in so doing, you know, I realised what the common, what the contribution to the common cancers were. I'm not including lung cancer here because really there isn't much of a Mendelian contribution. I'm going to talk about the other cancers. Um, um, this is the list of five here. Uh, and we'll add a few more later from uh, when JB talks, but these are the cancers where there's a substantial Mendelian um, contribution. Over the years, it's been worked out that this is roughly what to expect. As you see, ovaries a bit of a, a standout, and I'll come on to that later. And in terms of standouts, it's also interesting that BSC one 2 are themselves outliers in the sense that they're with the allele frequency on the, on the x-axis and, and the relative risk on the y-axis, you can see that BRC1 and 2 are actually both frequent and high risk. And that's, of course, why they were discovered first, because they were they had these properties that led them to be discovered first. Later genes that power B2 were harder to find because they were rarer and had a low risk, a lower risk. But I'll come on to that in a minute. So, um, so there was uncertainty about the risks. That was the key point. I, I remember going to an American Society of Human Genetics meeting when People were talking about offering genetic tests, this is about maybe 10 years ago, or offering testing for genes that we didn't know what the risks were. So I got together with a couple of colleagues um, led by Doug Easton and Paul Farrow and Anton Santini from the University of Cambridge to write this so follow-up piece to the original one, talking about um, you know, what we needed to know if we're going to be offering testing to the entire population. And uh, taken from that uh, paper is this table, which is, you know, it's obvious we knew about BRC1 and 2 and P53. We had a very good idea for a long time that these genes were important for breast cancer but other genes like p10 we really didn't there were virtually no published estimates even though we said well yes it probably causes breast cancer we had no uh we had very few estimates and for other genes we had good estimates but the risk seemed to be much lower uh below three and if the risk is below three then obviously there's a question well how useful is that to a clinician when the risks are you know are, are lower but palp2 we had a clear idea it caused a twofold risk, but did it cause a fourfold risk? Wasn't really known. And that led uh, Doug Easton and other people, and Fergus Couch in particular, to put together these enormous studies that really changed the game and justifiably were published in the New England Journal of Medicine with an editorial from Stephen Nayroyd, defining which genes really were genes for breast cancer. And essentially, they came up with this list here. So you can see here, um, BRC1, 2, um, PALB2 have very high risks, whereas CHECK2 ATM uh, have moderate risks, uh, and some genes have only association with certain types of breast cancer, such as REC51C that only seems to cause ER negative and particularly triple negative breast cancer. And some genes, which were thought to be breast cancer genes, are kind of dropped out of the running, and now we think that GRIP1 is not really a breast cancer gene. Um, for ovarian cancer, you'll notice that many of the genes that cause high-grade serous cancer of the ovary are very similar to the genes that cause breast cancer, and that's kind of interesting biologically. Uh, on the other hand, endometrioid ovarian uh, um, endometrioid or, or clear cell ovarian cancer have a very different genetic background, and it's caused mainly by the Lynch syndrome genes. So you could argue that you know it might be sensible to separate out these conditions. Whether that's actually practical, we'll get into later. Uh, particularly with Jean-Baptiste's talk. So you could imagine now that there are these 10 genes which all have slightly different functions. You've got the sort of the, the moderate risk ER positive genes that don't seem to have much of the ovarian cancer risk. You've got a gene here that has a, a risk for ER negative breast cancer, but ovarian cancer risk seems to be not there. You've got BRC1-2, that have, the canonical genes that have high risk for both breast and ovarian cancer, and so on. So it's not a question that all these genes have the same effect, but overall, these 10 genes, if you applied them across the population, you'd probably be able to interpret them appropriately uh, given suitable advice. And you'd be unlikely to uh, be using genes uh, in your test that really have no uh, utility. So if we compare 2008 when I wrote that piece with 2022, what have we learned? So I put in green, essentially genes that have switched from one status to another. And that's because there have been discoveries. But as you can see, not that many. Red51C and D are the big ones, I think. And there's been a lot of 
controversy about whether they actually cause breast cancer until quite recently, which pretty firmly established that they have a low but definite risk for triple negative breast cancer and therefore should be included on a breast cancer panel. If you then talk about ovarian cancer, you can see there have been more shifts again because PALP2 has now moved to the YES group uh, and RAD51 CD were not discovered until after the 2008 paper was written. So you can see there have been some gains uh, and we've, you know, we've lost a few genes as well, perhaps along the way, not so much for ovarian cancer, but now we have a list that initially when Mary Claire King published this paper, she had her list of 10 genes and the ones in red are kind of still around, but NBS and RAD50 have definitely, or NBN as it's now known, have definitely fallen out of the, uh, out of our compendium of genes. And now we have uh, over, you know, over this time period, we have a gene list that is, you know, s somewhat stable. You could add in um, CDH1, you could add in STK11, you could add in P10, but they're all sort of, they're all, for some reasons, you might not want to include one every panel, STK11 and P10 would have clearly syndromic features that you would identify, whereas all of these genes essentially have no syndromic features. The patient just has breast cancer and you wouldn't know why. So that would be a reason to perhaps select this set of genes, although I could certainly make the case for CDH1. When you look at pancreas cancer, again, there've been quite a few changes, um, uh, particularly PALB2 which wasn't identified as a risk factor until 2009, and it emerged as a, sort of an important but rare pancreas cancer gene. But you can see um, some of the risks actually have turned out to be somewhat lower, which is going to make surveillance very tricky. Uh, if the risks really are only 3% for, for BRC1, for example, does that justify doing um, endos uh, doing you know uh, um, endoscopic ultrasound and MRI in every year for somebody with a BRC1 mutation? Prostate cancer has changed a lot, but as you can see here, we still have a lot of question marks, despite a lot of work. We don't really know what the role of some of these uh, genes down the bottom are. It's pretty obvious that HOXB13 has emerged as an important gene, but there's nothing, there's n you can't target it. Um, whereas BRC1 and 2 have emerged, particularly BRC2 is a very important player. Uh, it was already known in 2008, but now it's become uh, established as the sort of the prostate cancer gene. Uh, and now with new drugs emerging, it's pretty obvious that patients who, uh, who have metastatic prostate cancer should be offered um, BRCA2 testing. Uh, when you look at colorectal cancer, again, there have been quite a few new polyp genes, NTHO1, poly, uh, and polia in particular. But I have to say these are, you know, very, very rare. I think we've seen one NTHO1 um, biallelic person uh, since we started doing the testing. So it's extremely uncommon. Uh, and not including it on a colorectal panel is would not be a crime. So uh, you can see here other genes like APC have been known forever. Uh, and essentially, you can split it into two groups the non-polyposis group, which are sort of the Lynch-like genes, and the polyposis group. So this is a now, as you can see, I have had to add um, MBT4 here uh, because it was discovered after Laura Valescu kindly gave me this slide. She's based in Barcelona. Uh, was discovered recently, but these are all very, very rare. So a panel including most of these genes uh, is now on offer at the MHC and uh, as I say, JB will talk about that. So it's important to remember that, you know, genetic counseling started at McGill with this paper from, um, from, from, um, from Clark Fraser in 1974. I love this bit about recent dramatic advances. It, every article seems to say this, uh, and that was 1974. So uh, recent dramatic advances ha had led to uh, genetic counseling being instituted and essentially the, the, the process uh, is one that's well established around the world offer genetic testing, uh, matched to a known syndrome, results of the second session, explanation of the implications, more testing is required, follow-up and referral. And so this has been going on for a very long time, but I think, I think we all accept now that the volume of patients, the knowledge acquired, means that this model uh, no longer fits, uh, fits the bill. And there's definitely been a changing landscape of testing. People have said, well, maybe we should test all patients with triple negative breast cancer. Maybe we should test all patients with this, that, the other. Maybe we should come up with criteria. And we spent a lot of time at McGill coming out up with criteria. Um, initially, we had no criteria uh, you know, when we started doing this uh, 20 years ago. And then we introduced criteria. But in the end, we didn't necessarily reduce our waiting lists. We didn't solve the problem by introducing criteria. Because there were more, it was more because more people became aware that testing was available, and more requests for for testing came along. So then the idea came out that you know maybe we need to 
get the tests outside of medical medical Jewish professionals. And it was in 2013 that this concept was first introduced and called essentially mainstreaming. So uh, advocated um, by Nazni Rahman and others in the UK. And the key elements are no direct contact with genetic counselors before genetic testing, test is ordered by the treating MD, results provided by the treating MD, the genetics team or both. Those with negative results are not seen by genetics unless there's a reason to see them because of some additional factors that have taken into account by the treating doctor. Those with positive results are referred to genetics for counseling and cascade testing and family members. Very important point, you know, to get the benefits, you've got to cascade the test out to people who aren't affected. It was first attempted for ovarian cancer at the Royal Marsden Hospital in the UK. And since then, it's been taken up in many centers. So should this raises a question, should genetic testing be sort of disease site focused? In other words, if you go to, if you're ovarian cancer at the Mars, and should you get an ovarian cancer panel? Um, we know that, as I showed you earlier, the genes for breast, ovarian, uh, pancreas, and just an extent prostate are all very similar. So should we, uh, should we be offering a panel that covers a mechanism or a disease? Um, a multi combination repair is a clear deficiency that's, that, that, that sort of marries these tumors all together. But some genes, like HOXB13, for example, are only really relevant for prostate cancer. So should we have a large number of site-specific panels or a small number of me mechanistically related panels? And this is something that we've struggled with at the at the sort of provincial level. And, and as AJB, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So for mainstreaming, would, would treating doctors like to order these specific panels or would they just say, look, I want to order what test I want to order? And then what's best for the patient? So these are all questions that, you know, it's, we're still struggling with to a certain extent. And before we get to mainstreaming, we have to prepare the ground. I don't think we could go from, you know, not doing it at all to suddenly doing it. And that's partly for, for logistic reasons that for many years we've been sending all our tests out of the country um, to uh, com commercial companies because the government has paid for this. Uh, but m most recently, they've decided to repatriate the tests. And that actually makes is gives us a great opportunity because now we don't have to fill in a whole load of forms, which takes forever uh, for a lot of people now. We, we can just simply have a form internally. Uh, and as long as the patient's educated, we should be able to do these tests uh, in-house much more quickly. So as a pre-mainstreaming, that's the word I just made up, in a pre-mainstreaming uh, approach, um, um, uh, George Agopoulos and Antibin Kugia decided to test all instant pancreas cancer patients at the MHC over this time period. And this was exceptionally aided by the fact the testing was free, was offered by Invite for no, no cost. And as you can see here, if you look about BRCA mutations, we were getting 6% uh, uh, positive, 7% for other genes. So um, mean ages were not really different and not very different to, to the actually unaffected people. We don't have that, but it's not very different. Uh, and this obviously look at that you know, very, very quick service uh, uh, turnaround time because it was sent uh, to the US and returned to us immediately. So, you know, a very nice initial study showing that uh, it's definitely worth doing this in terms of the pickup rate. Um, uh, and the other, the other genes that were found were all, you know, valid genes to have found. They were not of the 84 genes, there's a lot of the US is in kind of irrelevant genes, 45%, but we don't care about those really. What we care about is the variants seen in genes that actually do seem to potentially cause pan pancreas cancer. Um, what about breast cancer? Well, we did a study at the JGHMUHC and St. Mary's uh, in two phases. We called it the uh, the Great uh, Agata Study, which was funded by the QBCF and the Jewish General Hospital, and uh, over two phases. And we basically tested initially first primary invasive breast cancer any age, and then we restricted it just because, again, numbers are overwhelming. There's one person doing this study, essentially, either Zulika or Adrian Atayan. Um, we restricted it to women under 69 or any age of TNBC, and you can see not surprisingly, the BRC1 frequency went up when we restricted it because the older people don't have BRC1 mutations, uh, but the other mutations didn't. They didn't change, and that's because ATM and CHECK2 predisposed to breast cancer at pretty much any age. Um, so that was a, a sign that, again, if we use the data from GREAT, we would be able to mainstream testing effectively. Uh, the difference here, of course, is this is run by a genetic counselor. Uh, the physicians did not order the tests, but they we made it very easy for them to order these tests. All the testing was done by Dr. George Chong, who's been doing 
um, NGS since 2015 at the JGH, uh, and all patients were seen by a general counsellor. So it's not exactly mainstream, because the idea here is you, the person with cancer is seen by the cancer team, the person without cancer is seen by the genetics team, put simply. And this is the, this is the paper that really sort of uh, opened the gates to this type of work. So what's the goal of mainstreaming? Is it to test more people? Is it to identify people with actionable variants? Is it to generally increase access to testing through, through cascade testing? Is it to reduce waiting times? Is it to allow health professionals to focus on unaffected people? Is it to identify those who most benefit from targeted therapies? All these questions, you know, um, they can have different answers. Uh, and depending on what your answers are, uh, you could ask yourself, you know, what are we really trying to do here? So um, to say for, for ovarian cancer, the clear aim was to was to find people who would be eligible for drugs such as the PARP inhibitors. And this is a pro project started by uh, General Counselor Evan Weber with tremendous support from uh, from the obs and, uh, from the obstetric uh, from the gynecology oncology service, where the, this is really the first attempt to do proper mainstreaming again through a commercial company through Invitee, uh, although not funded by them, launched in two thousand and seventeen. All patients were treated by, were tested by an oncologist, results disclosed by a counsellor. But again, through the, just so many patients, in the end, it ended up being that the oncologists are now disclosing the results, which is an interesting point that maybe we'll come on to, on, on to later. So from the results, look at the difference. Before, um, before the gynae -onc oncologist initiated genetic testing program, Half of all patients were tested. Once it got going, it's basically 86%, and now it's almost everybody. So once people buy into this, almost everyone gets tested. And the, the time tested was reduced enormously. And uh, a nice paper from Michaela uh, Berkovich Sandinsky at the JGH, who's general counselor, showing that there was a lower distress, low distress, high satisfaction. And essentially, most people were very happy with this study. Benefits were that there were a few barriers, fewer appointments, more timely access, reduced waiting times, and enhanced collaborations. All these things that were good things. There were virtually no downsides. And of course, we picked up an actually a very, well, maybe not to us in genetics surprising, but I think to many people, surprising number of mutations. So we were picking up essentially, as you see here, uh, we had 28 causal mutations out of only 113 women. So that shows you that um, ovarian cancer is an extraordinarily um, strongly genetic condition, way stronger than we had thought and quite a lot stronger than breast cancer. Um, and, you know, this work by Evan and others has actually been recognized by the, by the Canadian uh, Health Standards Organization as a leading practice. So well done to, uh, to that group for pulling this off and offering this testing to so many people. Um, when you compare it with previous studies, these are four previous studies done in the UK of ovarian cancer mainstreaming, you can see that our results fit very much in the mold. We actually were testing, they only tested BRC12 initially, so they only they didn't have any other genes tested because this was early days, they didn't know about red 51 c and D, or they certainly didn't want to test for it, it was just really BRCA, but you can see adding in the other genes such as PALP2 and RADS do make a difference, pushing it up by another 8% with a very low VUS rate um, and um, the age of diagnosis as expected for the gene carriers is lower than the non-gene carriers. So we're, we're making a difference, I think, by identifying these people in a timely fashion. Uh, there are significant barriers to offering mainstream. And why hasn't it happened already, you might say? Well, a lack of a detailed appreciation of the risk that's taken us, you know, it gets to 2020 for us to know really what the risks are uncertainty as to which genes to test for and which person, which indication, that's sort of bundled up with the first point. The inability to run the test in-house was a major factor. And now that that's happening, that's going to, that's the first kind of condition. I think that we can do the test in-house. And now we, with fantastic work from uh, JB and prior work by George Chong, that's allowed that to happen. Is there enough um, manpower for the pre-test patient packages that required if people aren't going to have counselling, they still have to know about what they're getting into. We know this is an issue if they don't get any counselling. Are the practices in place to make sure positive results are correctly conveyed? We have enormous IT issues, as you know. So how are we going to get these results you know, from the lab to the patient and to the physician? And maybe the genetic counsellor could be the key person there in the lab giving the results directly from the lab to the patient, which would circumvent the issue of 
forms lying around on the desk of a, of a physician because he's so busy, has 20 of these forms and doesn't get to it in time and so on and so forth. But there are different practices and personnel at the level of institutions that also has to be taken into account. So um, in the final slide, I'm going to talk to you, know, which tumours are suitable? Are we going to mention everybody? Probably not. But from the GREAT study, we know that uh, women under 45 have a very high instance of BRCA1 mutation. We only needed to test less than 10 women to find a BRCA1, 2 or pelvic 2 gene, gene mutation. So obviously under 45, all triple negative breast cancer, when you're considering heart therapy, male breast cancer, people with Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, as we said, high grade ovarian cancer, pancreas cancer, um, uh, prostate, re prostate cancer that's become resistant to, uh, to castration and probably early onset colorectal endometrial cancers and so on. So, you know, one can argue about um, which criteria we should choose, um, which people should, should be included, but this is where we start, this is where we're starting with. And so at this point, I will, I will stop sharing. Uh, and let uh, JB tell you about what's been happening at the RQDM, what's been happening at the uh, at the, uh, the CMDL, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to demonstrate that we're we're getting ready um, uh, to mainstream. Thank you, Will. So um, before going through the the actual gene content and the indications, I'm going to give you a brief background to the MEs and what a couple of years. So the, the RQDM stands for the Réseau Québécois de Diagnostic Moléculaire. It involves all eight clinical molecular genetics labs in the province. The Centre Québécois de Genomic Clinique, which is a center for high throughput sequencing, and other partners, uh, including Genome Québec and the INES and the MSS Society. So the, the objectives of, the, of, of that network are to repatriate genomic tests that are, as we mentioned, currently sent out of province, mainly to the US, to try to harmonize practices in clinical genomic testing to ensure that the tests we order and the types of tests we do are relevant, are of the highest standards at the level of the quality and, and the safety. Also to advise the MSSS on the, the development of new genetic tests and eventually to support educational pro programs in the field and to promote secondary use of data for research and translational research purposes. So for cancer predisposition syndromes specifically, a working group was uh, put, together, put together and the, uh, the first objective of that working group was to produce lists of genes to test and recommendations for seven tumor sites in adults, some of the most common cancers, which uh, have a significant fraction of cases with a um, genetic predisposition. This documentation, once prepared, was submitted to the INES for review, which led to the document, the INES publication, uh, you can see the front page on the right in September. And so that was approved. And uh, some of these codes are now part of the Répertoire Québécois, a system de mesure des procédures de biologie médicale. So the, the seven indications that are covered by this inlet document are breast, ovarian, endometrial cancer, colorectal cancer, gastric, prostate, and pancreatic cancer. Uh, we, we've discussed testing eligibility criteria, which I'm going to show you. Uh, just note that you know, these criteria are not fixed in time. They may evolve as we learn throughout the process. Uh, we'll give it a try for you know, six months, 12 months, and readjust as needed if we see that you know, things uh, need to be fixed. Uh, but we need to start somewhere. I think it's also true for the content of genes. So obviously, as we showed, uh, the, the knowledge about these genes and their related risks for different types of cancers evolve. So as needed, we may want to change the gene content as well. So I'm going to go through each one of these indications and see what would be the testing criteria for 
mainstreaming. So in other words, for opening it up to other specialties that medical genetics. So breast cancer would target uh, 13 genes, and it would be for uh, individuals, females with breast cancer below 45 years of age, triple negative breast cancer at any age, breast cancer at any age, and at least one grandparent of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, or a breast cancer in a male who's 60 years old or younger. Ovarian cancer, 12 genes, as mentioned by Will. So it would be any high grade ovarian cancer, uh, pretty much at any age. Endometrial cancer, the testing criteria would be a cancer below the age of 50, 10 genes would be covered. You can see that there is significant overlap in the gene content with both ovarian uh, and breast. Colorectal cancer, the list is slightly larger. We have 18 genes, including all the Lynch syndrome genes. So the indication for, for mainstreaming would be any patient with a colorectal cancer before 50 years of age. For patients with a clinical suspicion of Lynch syndrome, these would continue to be managed and followed by medical genetics as, as of today, as it's, uh, as it's now. For pancreatic cancer, we, we actually started with Dr. Zogopoulos and uh, Adrian Kujia. So that would be any individual with a pancreatic adenocarcinoma pretty much at any age. Prostate cancer, it would be either a patient with a metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer below 80 years of age or a prostate cancer at any age and a high risk cancer based on either recent score, the cancer stage uh, or the levels of PSA. And to finish gastric cancer, that would cover 13 genes, two possible indications for mainstreaming a gastric adenocarcinoma before 50 years of age, or diffuse gastric cancer at any age. So in terms of pre-test considerations, if we go you know, deeper into the, the how-to, uh, so this would be the, the same kind of specimen as pretty much all the genetic tests we do. We do require two tubes of blood uh, with obviously you know, no fasting, no special diet, and the samples should be shipped immediately. The, we've prepared a series of documents. So that do include as for any of our tests, our test requisition, which is on the MUSC website. Um, physicians ordering genetic tests must obtain informed consent to pre perform such tests as per the law. I mean, we don't need a copy of that consent, but consent should be obtained. If you need a copy from the MUSC, it's also on the MUSC website. And we've also worked on testing eligibility criteria, which I'm going to show you. So in terms of the REC on the website, this is just a screenshot of the top of the REC, of the REC just to let you know that you can download a copy of the REC on the MHC website and you know, pre-fill and save a pre-filled copy of the REC with the name of the physician, license, the test requested. For women's streaming, it would basically be always to, to confirm the diagnosis of the, of the cancer transmission symptom. So this is our testing eligibility criteria prepared for um, mainstreaming. So you can see here on the top, the medical specialties who could order such tests. So obviously medical genetics, but also general surgical oncology, medical oncology, gynec as well as radiation oncology. And for each one of the sites, we've uh, split the criteria into the ones that can be ordered by any of these specialties and the ones that are still restricted to medical genetics. But so basically, if you have a patient with breast and or ovarian cancer, uh, you can you know, select one of these uh, one of these uh, boxes here uh, for colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer, I've mentioned already, pancreas, prostate, gastric. So it's a one-pager 
pretty quick to, to fill in. And it, it will allow us at the end of the year to collect data about you know, who did we test, for which indications, uh, which category provide uh, a, a good diagnostic yield, which category not that much and maybe would require more work, et cetera, et cetera. So in, in terms of the actual test, uh, what we do is targeted DNA sequencing based on next gen sequencing. We cover all the coding regions of these genes, plus the flanking intronic regions. Some selected non-coding regions are also covered because they are known to be enriched in pathogenic variants. The assay is designed to detect both sequence alterations in the genes, as well as copy number variants, such as deletions and duplications or, uh, of the genes or part of the genes. Clinically relevant variants are, are confirmed that the, the cause of the cancer in the patient is not genetic. It just means that we didn't find anything. Uh, as for many genetic tests, actually most genetic tests, uh, there are you know, tons of variants that are technically challenging and genes that are yet to be discovered. And so we can't exclude a variant not covered by the assay or in a gene not covered by the assay. And that's pretty much true for most genetic tests out there. In terms of interpretation and reporting, we, we do interpret variants as per guidelines in the field from the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, from the Canadian College of Medical Genetics. Uh, for some genes, such as BRC1 and 2, there are gene-specific criteria. A, a significant difference compared to the US lab is that in most situations, we will not report variants of uncertain significance. Because eventually, most of these variants will be reclassified as likely benign. We will only report the USCs that we believe would need some follow up to be reclassified as likely pathogenic or pathogenic. And we will provide recommendations, specific re recommendations for follow up in the report. But in most situations, we will not report the USCs, which should facilitate the work of, of referring physicians. Similarly, we will not report associations, low risk, non actionable alleles in the genes uh, we sequence. So the goal here is to identify uh, moderate and high risk alleles for ca cancer predisposition, not to go after you know, alleles that give 1.5 or uh, higher risk of developing a cancer. So here, that's just an overview of um, our report. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, first, it includes some demographic data and sample data on the top. What test was performed? What was the indication for the test? Here, a box with a high-level summary of the result. Typically, a genetic test is either positive, we found DNA variants, uh, that are clinically relevant and that are pathogenic for the indication, or negative, we didn't find anything, or inconclusive, we found something, but for some reason it, it's incomplete. Right? It's either a BUS or it doesn't you know, fully explain uh, the indication. Then typically, at least for positive cases, we have a summary of the, the variant in the gene, the nomenclature at the level of the DNA, at the protein, the zygosity, whether it's heterozygous, homozygous, hemizygous, in which exon it is in the gene, and its classification as per guidelines in the field, plus a summary of why we believe the variant is classified as pathogenic. Then a general paragraph of interpretation of the results. This, this is going to be gene specific, so you will have one specific paragraph per gene for positive cases. So here you have an example of uh, a typical paragraph for an individual with a BRCA2 pathogenic variant. Then any recommendations? Uh, the obvious one is to you know, 
test such variants in address relatives. That's one of the main purposes of doing such tests to go after at risk individuals and families. And then um, the test background, the test methods, and the test limitations. So it's typically a one pager. In terms of other uh, considerations, the, the, the goal is to match the turnaround time of, of US labs, basically. So you, you've seen results from Will, 10 calendar days to a month. You know, we want to be within the uh, two to four weeks time frame from sample reception. So as of today, and that's a big issue, reports are still faxed to the fax number provided uh, under requisition. Uh, for some reason, we, we fail at the provincial level to have decent uh, software or lab information management. Uh, but we are working at the level of the institution and the MSSS uh, to see how we could push these results automatically to OASIS and the DSQ. So just a heads up on one thing, we also have a, a, a generic email address for any question we, you may have regarding the molecular genetics lab. So now it's managed by a, a genetic counselor, Frédéric Coulomb and myself. So don't hesitate to touch base with us by email when you have any question. That being said, I'm going to stop sharing. And, uh, leave the microphone back to Will for concluding remarks. So um, in conclusion, um, I think, I hope, I hope that we've discussed the identification of the most important risk genes for the common cancers, that we've shown how knowledge of the role of these genes in cancer position has evolved over time, but still remains unsettled for some of the uh, rarer genes. Uh, but despite these uncertainties, we've acknowledged that it's time to decentralize the process of genetic testing and let the treating doctors order the tests. And our early experiences of versions of mainstreaming have been discussed. The role of the RQDM uh, and, uh, and, and now the CDML uh, has been uh, introduced. And we've set the stage for mainstreaming uh, within the McGill Ruiz to begin in earnest. We hope, uh, in at least for some of the tumours, in the first quarter of 2023. Uh, and with that note, I would point out that this is actually the topic of our conference in, in May uh, next year, which I hope um, many of you will attend, where we're going to be particularly discussing this from a whole, from a sort of a worldwide perspective. What's the experience in different places? Um, uh, and there's some great speakers. Um, some of you will know these people. Um, uh, but I hope that uh, I hope that uh, uh, you'll be able to. Some of you will be able to attend and learn a bit more about mainstreaming and, in fact, all aspects of uh, of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. So I think I will stop sharing. And uh, thank you all very much for your attention. And happy for JB and myself to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Folks and uh, Mr. Rivière, for presenting this. A really, really interesting. Uh, grand rounds and, and wonderful to see advancement uh, in this field that continues. Uh, let people uh, put in their questions in the chat. I must say I was surprised to see how many labs there are in Quebec that can do this. This is really quite new that there's involvement, there's, there's such decentralization. Uh, in terms of, you know, I'm just more curious in terms of quality and efficiency, has this been decided that this is the best approach, I guess? Uh, well, I, I'll start. I'll let JP continue. I mean, I think it's it's a it's a combination of a political decision and a pragmatic decision. I think it would be totally unacceptable that McGill did all the testing for the entire province, even if that made sense um, from an economic point of view. I should say though, there is a Quebec lab now at Saint Justine, and at some point it may happen that all testing will be done at Saint Justine. At the moment, they don't have the capacity, uh, and there's all sorts of issues with, with with how that would actually work. But I think the the feeling was was that the BRC1-2 in particular were such high volume tests that it made sense to decentralize them to uh, all the major uh, teaching hospitals that have genetics um, departments uh, or divisions within them. So that's my response. JB, do you have anything you want to add? I mean, it's definitely a challenge, I would say. There is a, there is a limited number of people in the province who I, I think can do clinical-based genomic tests. 
uh, it's going to take time. So, uh, I mean, we, we try to get organized at the level of the MUAC. You know, I'm not into the details of how the other labs are organized. But that's definitely a, a, a challenge. Fantastic. We have some questions in the chat. Does the presence of a gene prove that it is a transcriptomally active? Is that important? Uh, well, that's a good, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, you assume that the genes that have been selected have been selected because mutations in those genes are believed to be associated with disease. And in that sense, you assume that they're transcriptionally active in, in those people for whom uh, for whom um, the disease has been ascribed to uh, for those tumors. Um, but it's a good point, a more general point is, you know, of course, you know, RET, for example, you know, is obviously a gene important for a particular rare type of thyroid cancer. But it, I mean, RET, the gene is present everywhere, obviously, but it's not expressed everywhere. So that's the point about trying to choose genes that are relevant for the condition. Because if you find, I and mean, I didn't go into the details, but since you mentioned it, you may have someone, some hawk-eyed person may have noticed the asterisk on Evan's slide about the uh, Gynae uh, Onc initiated genetic testing, where we found an MSH2 mutation and a PMS, and a, uh, sorry, an MSH6 mutation and a PMS2 mutation in women with high-grade serious cancer, but they didn't cause the cancers because the genes were not active in those tumors. We know that from testing them. So that's a good point. If it's not expressed, then it can't be playing a role. Uh, but we assume, and that's why it requires some expertise. You can't just say, oh, we found a PMS2 mutation. That's the why they got cancer. You have to do, you have to, that's the point of having genetics, to be honest, is for us to start to think about what's really going on here. It's not just the test, it's the interpretation of the test that, 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 that we need to do the test. But at some point, uh, I hope that we'll be regarded as experts in this area. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, how do you envision or place somatic testing on tumor versus inherited testing when one main objective is to identify targets for testing? Uh, that's a fantastic question. I think that's from Brian. Well, you know, I'm a strong advocate of testing normal and tumor at the same time for all sorts of reasons, um, because the tumor informs the germline and the germ germline informs the tumor. Um, the, the trouble is, if you if you test a high grade serous cancer of the ovary tumor, you will find a P53 mutation in almost 100% of the time. How many of those are germline? You have no idea. You assume it's a very low number because we know that not all of about 20% of patients will have a germline mutation of which P53 is probably down the bottom of the list. But we did find one in our series. Again, if you noticed in Evan's slide, there was one case of a germline P53. That person would have been completely missed by a tumor testing program unless you test the normal as well. So if you're going to do normal tumor testing, you've got to do both. But the point is, is that the tumor testing has been aligned with an oncological view of what the, what the point of genetic testing is, which is to define targets. And what's happened is that we've now realized that actually the germline test also informs targets because of drugs like PARP inhibitors, which really, you know, the mandate now is to offer the test for someone who has a germline variant in brca one 2 not a somatic variant. It may be that these two things will be united. Uh, and I think that will be an ideal goal and hopefully we'll be in a position to do that. I would like to see, you know, FFP plus blood sent on every ovarian cancer patient to JB. We're getting ready to do that kind of thing. But it's not when, you know, it, it's, it's step by step. I think let's get this done first. If we achieve this, then I think we can move on to normal plus tumor, which is the natural next step. Fantastic. Uh, question here about, does anyone from genetics continue to follow up on the VUS results if ever they're deemed pathogenic? to feed that back to the patient. So, uh, well, yeah, JP, yeah, you should I, respond I, to this. I can yeah. answer. So yeah. all the variants we identify, including USCs, we enter them in our database of variants, right? So obviously we don't systematically go through all the variants for reclassification on a weekly basis, right? But if we, if we find that one of these variants is to be reclassified as likely pathogenic or pathogenic, it's it is pretty easy for us to go back at the data and identify the, the patients with such variants and contact the physicians uh, as needed. Perfect. But, it should, get... yeah. oh. but it certainly wouldn't, I just say it wouldn't be a responsibility of the, of the physician because they wouldn't know about it. I mean, it's going to say, it's, the test is going to say that there's nothing found. So 
the only VUSs that are highly likely to be pathogenic in the future would be reported. And then that's JB, of course, would go back and tell you if it changes. Fantastic. Before I go to the hands that are up, uh, just one last question here from Eva. Practical question. How far does the responsibility of the ordering physician go to ensure follow-up with family members if a significant gene is discovered on their patient? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've struggled with this, and that's one of the reasons in my list of things why we haven't done mainstreaming before is to do with that. Uh, I've been thinking about maybe you know to, to more integrate the role of genetic counselors into this process, so that they would in, they would issue the results to the patients, um, uh, you know, with, with the assistance of the physician. And if that's done, then I think that then the, the point about contacting the relatives sh should be more straightforward because the genetic counselors are very accustomed to writing family letters, which I don't think we've, you can expect the physicians to do. So the idea is that the family, that the, the genetic counselor would, would write to the patient with a letter for distribution to the relatives to say, um, there's been this variant found in your family, not necessarily naming the person, you know, Please, please, here are the following, here's the following information about the gene, the variant, where it was found, and so on. And here's the service address, you know, you can contact us and so on, to give people uh, a chance to, 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 to cascade properly. So I think that's a very important. I don't think it can be the responsibility of the physician to make who's ordering the test to make sure the relatives get tested. I think that should, you know, I think we've got to carve out new roles. Uh, and this is one of the roles I think is going to be absolutely critical. If this if this whole thing is going to work, that the genetics team have to take over when it gets to unaffected people. Fantastic. So, uh, we're going to ask the chief of genetics, Dr. Bettina Muchaleni, to please, uh, you can uh, un unmute your, mic your uh, microphone and, and speak. Yeah, I had a question too. Uh, sorry, I was actually not uh, beforehand. But um, so I guess one concern as a geneticist that I always have is when you talk about mainstreaming, you obviously have people who are not geneticists who are now going to offer testing to parent to to patients um so that the the process of consenting is something that's really near and dear to my heart so that people understand what they get themselves into when they agree to genetic testing and uh it's if you go large scale so how do you address that uh, now that you have physicians who are maybe not as literate in in medical genetics to um, approach the patients to make sure that the patients know what they get into, because especially if you have maybe a variant reclassification in the future for them to understand what happened and what are the limitations also on the genetic test. That's kind of my major concern. Right. Um, well, um, my, I think that's, that's again, one of the main reasons why we haven't introduced this already um, because we need, we recognize we need patient information material. I know everyone, Weber and others have been working very hard on creating national documents that could be used. Um, there's also a thing called uh, Genetics Advisor that's run out of Toronto by Yvonne Bombard, who's been funded from the CHR uh, to do this work, which is an online uh, educational uh, activity. There's lots of ways of doing this. It's just trying to find the best way for us um, and to ensure the patients have signed it. You know, they're going to sign a consent form. The question is, you know, what, what, are, they, what are they agreeing to? Uh, and I, I understand that completely. Um, we haven't noticed any problem in the great study. I mean, everybody consented pretty much, but then they met with a genetic counselor. So it's a different process when they don't. And, you know, to a certain extent, you know, as, as JB said, I mean, it's the physician's responsibility to get the signature. If the patient, if the form says they consented, then if there's any problems, it's the physician who's going to have to handle it, not me, because you ordered the test. I mean, that's the point. If you order the test, you're responsible for interpreting it, at least it, it, for dealing with the question that the patient says, I never consented to this. So, well, you know, that's going to be the issue. So there's going to be some give and take here uh, in exchange for this testing. This has to be an understanding that the consent process is being handed over to you uh, with our help. Um, but that's going to be something that you're going to have to have to make sure you're, you're, you're happy with. And that's why we did the pre pre mainstreaming projects that the, the physicians, the, the breast surgeons ordering this didn't have to worry about consent, that that was done by a counsellor. But as we move forward, um, you know, I think that 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 can't continue. And so we're going to have to pr provide the right kind of paperwork. And I know Evan, I know if Evan's on the call, but Evan has worked quite hard on this. And I think that's why I'm saying, hopefully, the, once that paperwork is ready, that'll be the real process by which this will happen. Once that's until that's ready, we're not going to mainstream, basically. And when it is ready, we will. And we'll see what happens. 
Thank you. We have two minutes left. Uh, ben Smith, your hand is up. Can we just have a quick question from you? Yeah, thanks, Nadia. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I was great talk, actually. Um, I was surprised on your slide about what are the goals of mainstream testing that it didn't really state things like helping people live longer or live better. So I'm curious about, uh, are there studies showing that this type of screening actually benefits people in meaningful ways, uh, I guess, from the perspective of the patient or the population? And are there cost effectiveness studies to show that this is where money should be invested? Right. Um this two, two parts of the question, I think. Um, the cost effectiveness that have been done, particularly by uh, Ranjit Manchandra in the UK, clearly showing compared to other ways of doing testing, it's cost effective. Okay. In terms of, you know, per mutation identified, for example. But the first question, of course, is the key question. And you're absolutely right to question that. We don't really have that kind of data. Uh, I don't, it's been very hard to show the benefit um, of, of, of people, um, of, particularly when you're testing people up front who already have cancer, then obviously the incremental advantage may be somewhat, somewhat small. Um, so the goals haven't been as lofty, perhaps, uh, as the obvious one of, of, of saving lives, because I, I don't want to overclaim here. It would be nice, if, for example, you could argue that the best reason to test someone for a breast cancer gene is to make sure they don't get ovarian cancer. OK, so can you measure that? Well, it's difficult to prove when, you know, relatively small numbers, people not dying of ovarian cancer. It may be hard to spot that in a population. But I think that's one of the is one of the major goals. So it could be something like that. Endometrial cancer, you might be preventing a colon cancer in somebody with Lynch syndrome. So it may not be a direct effect on the cancer itself, because that may happen anyway through the kind of testing that Brian was talking about, tumor testing. But the germline testing, whether it means the person is susceptible to other tumors, or the family members are susceptible to other tumors. Uh, that's really where I think where the advantages will come. But you're absolutely right. Uh, there aren't the studies that absolutely show um, convincingly that this is uh, th that that a goal will be achieved by this process. Thank you so much. It's coming on. It, it is one o'clock, so I'll have to close out these rounds. There's an extra question in the chat. If I you to answer Dr. Barron's question, perhaps directly in the chat. Thank you really for this a wonderful presentation. Uh, very exciting to see this work moving forward. And I do hope that you keep us posted. We hear again from you again next year. Uh, thank you uh, to Genetics for bringing our speakers today. And uh, please do answer the remaining question in the chat. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.